Thank you for the outstanding. Okay. Thank you for the outstanding. I hope that will be interesting at least. And uh, okay, surprise, I'm not speaking in Italian and in Italy, but that's anyway. Uh, thank you all. Uh, sorry for the, the delay. We were, we were waiting for someone that will be joining us in time. So um, what I'm going to talk about today, I'd like to stay in 20, 25 minutes if I can to leave some room for Q and A's and uh, I will be happy to answer any question. Don't be shy and be straight to the point. Um, first of all, how many of you have heard about GaiaX? Hmm, good. How many of you know what GaiaX is? Cool. <laughs> it's normal. Uh, I spend my, my days and weeks going around talking about it. So before going into, into GaiaX and what it is, I'd like to give you a kind of uh, journey on what we're talking about. So let's talk about the future of Europe. And I'm not exaggerating, I'm talking about the future of Europe when I talk about the future of European digital ecosystems. Why? Because economy fully depends on digital. And I'll try to give you some elements to understand and believe in it. And therefore, maybe you understand why we're doing what we're doing. So first of all, um, let's think about what is the sector most impacted by digital? No one in particular, all of them are impacted. There is no one in the industrial, social ecosystems or natural ecosystem that is not impacted. And the impact is in the need to transform those traditional or analog ecosystems, if you want, into digital ecosystem through the implementation of data spaces. What are data spaces? Data spaces are the digitalization of value chains. So basically, the data space are the digital representation of all the elements in a, in a value chain, in a supply chain, or in any sort of value chain. And like I said, this is impacting every one of us. But I'd like to understand if, if at the end of this speech, you will be in agreement with me. So if that is true, and I think many of you have a role in IT, one of the key questions is how is the role, of, what is the role of, the, of IT in this new world? We are all used about uh, IT being a kind of enabler of the business. And in the last three decades, IT has been basically used to automate existing processes in the best case. I think the, the IT has got a new role, which is different than digital. So the new role of IT is to change the business instead of supporting the existing business. The new role of IT is no more to automate existing processes, but to zero the processes. Better the role of digital uh, and IT should, you know, transform into this new role. The role of digital is to change the business. IT used to support the business. The role of digital is to zero the processes. IT used to automate the processes. Digital is a must have. So it's not a nice to have as usually it is in enterprises and in businesses or in the, in the public sector. Also, IT used not to be a business driver or business enabler. It used to be a cost to support IT operations, uh, to support business operations. Instead, digital is a business enabler. And of course, we need to move into a continuous innovation because digital is a moving target. And the approach to digital is completely different from the approach of IT, which is try to manage the existing. The digital requires to manage the future and the unknown. Therefore, we need a new role for executive. The new executive of IT should not be managing the existing, managing the operations of existing, but it should be a strategist driving the company, driving the CEO in strategic decisions to evolve the business. The, the role uh, of the executive in the new digital world should be to drive the business opportunities and therefore be measured also on business outcomes, not on cost retention, not on cost reduction year over year, like typically IT executives do today and CIOs have been used to do in the last decades. Also, the, the new role of IT executives should be to evangelize about digital because it's a moving target and we need someone to lead the organizations in that direction. Organization can be public or private organization. Last but not least, I'd like to say that we should move from a yes butter 
attitude into a can-doer attitude. M most often, IT executives tend to protect and uh, retain the existing instead of changing it. And uh, change is possible and necessary, so we must have a can-do attitude. But if technology is so important and it's changing our economy, the key question is, are we in control or controlled by technology? We asked ourselves our question, and the answer is easy. We are controlled by technology today. So what is your doing about it? Let's think about some key steps taken by European Union. First of all, uh, well, you know, next generation EU. So the big, big transformation plan that has got digital transformation as one of its key pillars. So in 2020, President von der Leyen announced the new European strategy for data. The objective here is to create a common market for data in Europe. So it's a real objective. In May 2020, we all know what happened uh, during the pandemic and the recovery funds were announced. This is a one-off unique opportunity ever. 750 billion euro have been instantiated. By the way, Italy has got 30% of that amount, so it's uh, quite a lot of money. And there is just two, uh, two titles in this uh, recovery fund strategy that have a minimal compulsory um, amount of money to be spent. This is digital transition and green transition. Digital has got a minimum of 20%, which means 150 billion of those 750 billion have to be spent to transform digital Europe. And for Italy, this accounts to 50 billion. In October 2020, there was a declaration made by a group of representatives of the European economical fabric uh, that constituted an alliance, which is called the European Alliance for Industrial Data and Cloud that signed a declaration where they said we need to build common European cloud. That translated into a project which is called IPSI in European mission terms. IPSI stands for Important Project for European Common Interests that is going to instantiate more than 10 billion to develop a full stack developed by European technologies. This is the intent of from silicon up to software as a service. This is going to start soon. And last but not least, we have also the digital decade strategy that was announced in uh, March 21 that indicates skills, uh, government infrastructures and businesses, the directives of change, and uh, sets targets on edge and cloud. So all these things happen in a relatively short amount of time, as you can see, like Europe woke up in the middle of the night and said, we must do something. But why is that? Is it so important? We will get to that point. So let's give a look to what the European data strategy is. The European data strategy aims to create free data flow or enable a free data flow to create common data spaces within specific ecosystems and across ecosystems in Europe. In order to make available high quality of data, you know why? Without quality data, you can have the best HPC performing uh, computing infrastructures, but you need data to enable the next generation of AI-centric uh, services. So we need to make available good data. We need to make them available through commonly agreed upon rules, and these rules must respect the uh, European principles of free circulation of goods, free circulation of citizens, and free circulation of everything that unfortunately we don't have for digital. The digital decade, which is another pillar of the strategy, aims to create a computing continuum. This is an important thing. Why we're we talking about computing continuum? Because we have uh, been used to a model of cloud, uh, and cloud per se is not digital economy, but we'll come back to this point soon. But we've been used to a model of cloud, which was the enabler for that economy, which was centralized. So, in other words, cloud was born for someone like uh, me with some white hairs, long time ago with the expectation to be distributed compute. Unfortunately, translated to be a centralized, a hyper-centralized, hyper-scalable, but hyper-centralized computing remotely managed by someone else. 
and I keep joking about that basically is remote outsourcing. But that's what it is at the beginning, what it is today, largely. Now, this is not working anymore. Why? Because of data gravity. Data have grown everywhere in a way that we cannot control. So it's no more possible to bring the data to the compute. You need to bring compute to the data. And you, you need to have the chain of computing all along from you know, central computing down to on device, near edge, far edge. Because the only way to deal with the power of data is to calculate as close as possible to where the data is generated. Otherwise, you cannot have 5G, 6G, 7G. It doesn't matter because there is a physical limit, which is the, light, the speed light. So the computing continuum, together with the need to create common data space, uh, common data spaces, is the foundation of the European strategy for digital. So how does GAIA-X fit into it? Well, if you look at this slide, on the top side, <clears throat> top left, top left, yes, you have the objective to create common data spaces. On the top uh, right, sorry, your top right, you have the need to create common data spaces. On your top left, you have the objective to create a common cloud, European cloud infrastructure. And there is a lot of initiatives that go from the creation of cloud rule books, investments, a lot of calls for proposals, et cetera, that go in that direction. Just to give an example, recently in the last months, the European Commission issued a call for proposal for 200 million investment for the creation of common data spaces. Uh, roughly 15 calls for proposals. I, I, I can proudly say that 80%, uh, uh, not 90, we are still waiting for the last uh, uh, awards uh, have been awarded to members, consortiums of members of AIX and the like. Um, on the uh, bottom side, you see what GAIA-X is doing. GAIA-X is on one side, enabling the creation of common data spaces. How? Putting together actors from the industry, large, small enterprise from any country within outside Europe, by the way, but mainly focused on Europe in this case, and asking them to define use cases and business cases and projects in their specific business domain. On the other side, we are creating a new generation of data infrastructure. If you want a new generation of cloud, which is completely different from the uh, existing one, which, uh, which is going to be federated, transparent, controllable, and interoperable, which are the key requirements to make this dream happen. Now, why GAIA-X? Let's go back to the cloud. Is, it, is cloud an element of economy? Uh, well, it is, yes, in, in strict terms, but per se, cloud does not provide a data economy. But without the cloud, we wouldn't have enabled the so-called platforms economy. Platforms are an agglomerate of technology that takes the power from the injection of all the many sources of data, elaborate them, correlate them, and apply algorithms, and thanks to the artificial intelligence and other technologies, create the so-called smart services that transform, we say, traditional ecosystems into smart ecosystems. So cloud, per se, does not build data economy. But without the cloud, we wouldn't be talking about any data economy. It wouldn't simply be possible to deal with the amount of data and the amount of calculation that you need to enable it. But if that's the case, let's talk about money. What is the business of, say, data economy? In 2025, we're going to see roughly, say, 900 billions, which is 8 to 10% uh, GDP points. So per se, this is already substantial. But we are not in a good position in Europe, as you can see. But we have good opportunities. This is the uh, focus of, grow, uh, of growth of, uh, say, the cloud and digital market. The SaaS market will grow incredibly. Edge computing will become dominant and preeminent. All the venture capitalists in the US are investing in edge. Now, just to give an example. Telco uh, is moving fast to the 5G, and everybody knows how important this is. Industrial IoT, B2B, and B2C will become you know, prevalent in every business, even in the, in the less digitized, like agriculture. But where we are, we have a ridiculous position as Europe. This is a slide from Ghana, 2020. Things don't change so quickly, fortunately. And we own 
4% of the total market capitalization of companies that provide data back. So this is not the amount of the digital economy, but it's a very good indicator. And you can see US has got 74% with roughly 20 companies listed, Asia comes after. So we must do something to gain position in that market. But let's look at the, the trend of cloud. What I'm saying is so true that in just three years, from 2017 to 2020, the cloud market tripled. So you can see here from two to six billions just in Europe. But this is just the ASPAS and also the private cloud. So it doesn't contain SaaS, which is the biggest portion in terms of revenues. But the cloud, the European cloud service provider declined from 26 to 16, 15%. Whilst three players hold 70% of the market. You can read that, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. They keep maintaining their position and they keep taking control of this huge market and of the platforms that manage the data that are necessary to build our economy. So, um, Let's look at the trends. In terms of supply, the market is growing, but unfortunately, our European players cannot stand with it. They are losing market. And three players own almost 70% of the market. The biggest European one has got less than 2%. I don't remember whether this is uh, Deutsche Telekom or OVH, but it doesn't matter. In terms of demand, companies are asking more and more for switchable services with more user control. Unfortunately, they're not available in the market. They have a strong dependency from legacy applications and legacy infrastructures. 80% of the applications and the data are still on premises and legacy, despite everybody believes the cloud is diffused. This is not true. The level of adoption by Eurostat data of cloud in European companies is less than 26%, which means 80% is under the desk, untapped, unutilized. So, Yes, cloud is used for very basic services, email, file sharing, uh, video conferencing, that kind of stuff. But no one is really putting their core data of their core businesses into the cloud. Not yet. Why? We will talk about that. So let's have a look to the European future in 2025. A few years. It's not 20 years. Looking at the numbers, I see the market share of European cloud service provider declining below 10%. This means in a crossing. The GDP of digital market is going to grow above 10%, which is substantial. But the European footprint in terms of business is largely made by small, medium enterprises. There is no way they can uh, have a, a let's say, position in the market unless we enable a mechanism of federation. So joining the dots across existing European cloud service providers possibly create critical mass in the scale of big babies and cannot compete with the large American players today. If you look at the, econ the economy, yes, 10% of the GDP is a lot, but economists say that 50 to 70% of the value of products and services in the next few years, we're talking about 25, will be determined directly or indirectly by data. If you want an example, I can ask you a stupid question like, I don't know how many of you has got a, a, an electric car. I don't. I drive a very noisy uh, thermic engine car. But many of you maybe are thinking about it. And you know that by 2030, there will be just electric cars. Now, do electric cars cost less, to, less or more of thermic engine cars? Too small. Do they in, in, uh, use more expensive or less expensive technology? Less expensive. Do they use let me say, uh, the engineering of the last 100 years that has have been largely developed in Europe? No. It's very general purpose technology. So why is that? Because the value perceived is completely different. It's not a behind. It's a data platform that allows you to get the benefit of a platform of services that engage you as a driver, connect you with the external ecosystems and with the community of the drivers. So this is just to give you an example, the same applies to smart fridge, smart TVs, etc. Last but not least, uh, we have a problem with sovereignty. Everybody talks about sovereignty. Sovereignty is a political concept, but there cannot be political sovereignty without digital sovereignty. You cannot drive the economy without digital sovereignty, and there cannot be private 
or autocratic sovereignty. Private sovereignty is what determined, what is determined by private actors that decide how to make use of their data. Yes, within the law, of course, within the regulations. Nonetheless, they have black boxes that treat our data. Autocratic platforms, of course, refers to uh, autocratic countries like China that by definition cannot have the same principles of transparency that we expect to use in. So federating ecosystems, creating common data spaces in order to create those digital value chains that allow us to be more competitive in building digital products where data will determine the price of the market and develop a concept of trust such that we can trust the technology platforms that treat our data is necessary for the future. So what is GAIAX? GAIAX is a non-for-profit association. It was started as a German project, German governmental project in late 2019. Then it became immediately a Franco-German project to build a sovereign cloud for Germany and France. But all of a sudden, all the member states want to participate. So it turned to be um, an international association that aims to build, to enable the creation of common data spaces through the creation of this new generation of rules and the technology that will verify the compliance of those rules that are necessary to have trusted, trustworthy services. Basically, we want to move from a decentralized proprietary opaque model, which is the one dominate today, into a model of distributed, open, and transparent cloud. And you understand why this is necessary. This is what we mean by digital sovereignty. We want to move from a model where we let somebody control our data to a model where we get full control of our data. Or if you want to look in another way, we want to move from a one-way approach to a roundabout approach. Because the real problem is not the availability of technology. The available technology is fantastic, but why it is adopted, it is not adopted, because the level of adoption is very low. Because of the amount of legacy, because of the risk of transformation, because of the certainty that when you adopt some technology, you're gonna be locked in. And therefore, this is a major business risk that is preventing European economy to progress. In other words, we want to move from a model like this, where this X is split. On the top side, you have the data ecosystems, which are untapped, fragmented, disjoint. And there is no secure way to exchange data within the same ecosystem or across, the, uh, across different ecosystems. And if you look at the infrastructure, they are usually uh, segregated, applying proprietary standards, uh, non-interoperable, into a new model where thanks to these three categories of services, federation services, compliance services, and exchange services, we connect the two worlds. This is the objective of KX, and this is the X of KX, by the way, visual mind. And uh, that's what we are building. So we are building a framework that decomposes down into those three categories of services. So the association is peculiar. We're not just talking, it's not just a think tank. We have 2,000 people from 350 plus companies working together in more than 20 working groups, but not just writing specification or potential standards. We are developing code, where applicable, into these three categories of services which are necessary to enable what I just described. If you want to have a look at it, you can go on the website, uh, doc.gaix uh, slash framework, you can browse to the framework where you see compliance, the federation services, bit exchange, and different layers. The layers tells you where we are defining just specifications, functional specification, and or technical specification, and or software components, and or compulsory uh, software components, or optional software components. So there is a lot you can see if you go on our website. And this is the operation model of GAIA-X. So basically we're building this software stack. The green part or the yellow part in the bottom part is what we are building. The uh, upper part is what our members and other non-members will develop on, on top of it. We're using what they have. They don't have to get, develop anything new. Then, moving to the right, you see what we're doing. So we are uh, developing standards uh, in a set of committees. And uh, we are developing the code within the open source community. All I'm talking about is the open source. And, uh, and then we rely on uh, specific rules and on trusted anchors, uh, trusted anchors in the lingo of SSI, sovereign identity, 
uh, those entities that verify the ver verifiable credentials of a service. I'm not going into the technical description, but there is a, a lot behind that goes in the direction of the most recent evolution of decentralized architecture, such sovereign identities, etc. And uh, so GAIA-X is an association where we define this new standard. We are making available all we do open source. We are totally private. They're not subsidized or funded by any public institution. All the money we get is from our members that believe in what we're doing because this is necessary for them. We are not going to be a formal standard of body. We're not going to develop any software or hardware product. And we're not going to be a single runtime execution of any of the components because we don't want to be uh, taking the authority, the, 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 the only one providing trust. Instead, this is going to be a distributed model where several nodes will execute the client services and provide for the trust that was described. Definitely, uh, <clears throat> there's a difference between the association and the project. So the, the association is developing the project. The uh, architecture and the specifications are developed by the association members, which represent the voice of the market. And the services will be operated by the members, not by the association. So we are no competitive, free competitive. And that, that's the only way to be credit. What we deliver is three things, specification, code, and labels. The labels we provide for certain we have a five years roadmap. Last year, I joined in March 21, so maybe this is 17th uh, month. This is the 17th month, and uh, this is the roadmap I designed to join, and uh, we are walking the talk. Last year was the setup year, so we defined what KIX is, and we want to start the first uh, implementation of the Federation services, and also start identifying some initial projects in the market that want to develop the extent. Year two, so this year, is the adoption year. So what we started doing from the beginning of the year is the implementation of all this story. So on one side, the association is implementing client services, the federation services that I've been talking about. On the other side, we have already seven projects that started last year. And in the next summit in November in Paris, they will show the results. The third year is the growth, in other words, if this works, we show how it works, we show that it is possible, the users may will be able to ask for GAIAX compliance services in their procurement, and the providers will have to be compliant. This will create this snowball effect, will create the demand in the market. That's what we aim to do. We don't want to force the European Commission or anyone else to impose GAIAX. But by uh, definition, we are the only one doing such a thing in Europe. And we want to create a disruption. Basically, what we are trying to do is build something that does not exist, is needed as, uh, by the market, and we are the first one to win. That's the only way to be successful. This is the operational model. I will not go into the detail. We have three committees, one taking care of the policies and rules, the regulation, if you want, and the rules that we want to verify the services. Data Space Business Committee is enabling the creation of common data spaces. The technical committee is taking care of defining the technical architecture of KIX. Then, as you can see, we elaborate, we develop, create the software framework, which is used by the market services that are provided by the projects that are run by our members. So it's a virtual circle where we are not aiming to get research and investment funding, creating POC. We want to create an impact in the market. This is an example of the projects we, uh, we are running. These are some projects funded by Germany and France that are not giving money to us, but they have made public tenders to develop some of the Federation services components I was talking about. Uh, some of them have been delivered, uh, for example, by the German project. The second phase has started. Some others are going to be delivered by the French project, which started at the end of last year. And these are examples of the Lighthouse projects. There is more. But Catena X is an example of a federation in the automotive market. This is the largest automotive initiative in the last possibly 50 years. So BMW, Volkswagen, uh, uh, Daimler, uh, together with uh, Stellantis, together with uh, hundreds of OEMs have decided to group together and share the data. You may say, why? Because all of them realize that without sharing the data across the value chain, they will not be able to create the car of the future. They will not be able to create data platforms. They will not be able to demonstrate the carbon footprint of their product. There is no way you can be trusted unless you really use the data all across the value chain. It's unprecedented because all of them were still our competitors, but they found a way to share what they need to get value, all of them. 
AG the tab is a data space in the agriculture that is expanded to the agri-food. So all the chain from production to distribution of the food, creating a common data space from farmers to large distributors. Struttura X is an example of the first federation of European cloud service provider that decided to get together a robot system, OVH, uh, outscale, uh, you name it, to create a federated offering of cloud service provider. That new model that was talked about and many others. So the compliance is complicated. Maybe this is the more technical part of it, but I don't want to take all the time for that. This is the NIST view of the uh, cloud federated uh, cloud federation mode. NIST recognizes these three planes, the usage plane, the management plane, and the trust plane. The usage plane is where you exchange data across participants in a collaboration, uh, education, and use different technologies. To do that. Management plane is where you decide one specific federation or one specific ecosystem, decide what are the rules, for example, with whom I want to exchange the data for doing what, I enforce those rules. But they sit on top of a common, most important layer, which is the trust plane. Uh, the trust plane. Without trust, none of the data exchange can occur. This is what Kayaks is built. The trust and the compliance work in this way. We have two components, the trust framework and the, and the labeling framework. The trust framework, we have a set of technologies that allow any providers to describe their services simply through a self description where you have all the verifiable claims, all the characteristics of, uh, characteristics of your service, including your identity. Then we verify those characteristics through trusted anchors, which are certification authorities on performance assessment bodies that digitally verify and embed their signature into that, uh, into that self description. Then we have a register. So basically, it's a kind of notarization registration digital office that allows anyone to expose their services, anyone can be by as long as you want to be described, respectable, and controllable. It's an identity card for digital services. Nothing more, nothing else. But in this way, we can demonstrate that someone wants to be interoperable, someone else don't. Someone can really operate the services from Europe, someone cannot. Someone has got a service composition where they, yes, they may have a data center in Europe, but a hundred of other data providers that compose the service spread across the world. And today, you don't have that type of visibility. The labeling is a different story. It's not compulsory, but if you want to decide that in Italy, the Polo Strategico Nazionale is defining a set of rules to define what type of services can deal with critical data, well, those type of rules must be verified. In the normal world, you have certification authority and human processes to do that. In this world, those rules can be codified in a label, and the label is a filter on top of the verification made by, made by the trust frame. This way, when you search for a, for a GAIA-X service in a marketplace that uses the catalog, which is one of the components we are developing, you will be easily find the type of services that match exactly your criteria or your label. So, in this way, we are simplifying the relationship between suppliers and providers of technology. Because nowadays, this is a huge black box. So you trust your providers because of their claims, because of some terms and conditions in a contract, but you have no possibility to open those black boxes. And unfortunately, this is the problem. Anybody can be defining uh, a, a, its own label. You can imagine in France, we have Second Cloud. In Italy, we have Polo Strategico Nazionale. In Germany, we have C5. Different standards to define security. They are very much aligned. In ESA, which is a new agency, the European Agency for Cybersecurity, is defining a new common standard, standard, which is called EUCS. Maybe we will have one common standard. But at that point, somebody has to demonstrate that your service will be complied to that standard. How do you do that? Technology can help. That's what we're trying to do with AIs. So 350 plus members, 20 working groups, 2,000 people, 25 countries, seven hubs. We have large and small and startups. We have users of technology from industrial, banking, insurance, any sector, universities, uh, research institution. We are the largest representation of the European economic world. 
<laughs> we have 17 hubs, 15 are European, but interestingly enough, not only Europe is interesting what we are doing. You see Japan and South Korea, but I can tell you that I'm working open in the US. And you might ask, what well, US is interesting? Yes, because the problem is not US. The problem is private actors that want to keep control of their own position. And this is exactly the same problem outside of. We also have a governmental advisory board. This is a pretty unique thing. We group together all the representatives of the government where we have a hub to sit together twice a year to share their strategies. So what is Italy doing? What is Spain doing? What is France and Germany doing in terms of digital transformation? Why don't we do it together? Why don't you share with us your strategies? What they do, they develop these metrics where they say, okay, in Spain, we want to work on tourism. And in Germany, we want to lead on Austria uh, and on. But then all the other countries says, okay, I want that too. I want to be part of that. And then we go to our hubs that group members and companies of the local territory to make proposals that are then also funded by the public, but co-invested by these members. And this way, we are enabling a pan-European uh, digital transformation. So all the projects we have, they have started in Germany, in Italy, in France, doesn't matter, but they have become all cross-national. So a lot of material you can find on the website, uh, news, media kit, uh, events, please mark your calendar for the 17th and 18th of November, where uh, we are going to have the summit. The title of the summit I wanted to have is Gaiax is up and running. It's going to be interesting. Uh, last year, uh, no, we didn't have a, anything up and running. I said it very smartly. Now we're going to have something up and running. So stay tuned. Lots, lots of links here. I can leave you the, the, the slides. You can distribute them. Maybe don't distribute the, the cap ones. Just they are not. But there's a lot of links that you can browse if you want to, to read a lot. So. Uh, I hope that was useful, and um, I hope we have some minutes for Q and A's, if any. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, if not, um, well. In any, in any case, just a very quick question. I would like to link with one of the last slides that you used, listing the all the all the many member states that you are in contact with. And uh, my, my curiosity is about if you, from your position of uh, talking to them directly, if you see some uh, willingness from them also to cooperate among different member states, or uh, are they addressing only their own? Uh, requirements or requests? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and this is not uh, a wish or wishful thinking. It's happening. And by the way, it was a strong mandate by President von der Leyen. Uh, maybe you, you can go back and read the State of the Union speech of uh, President von der Leyen last year. She said clearly, we should stop doing things by ourselves in every single country. We should work together. And uh, this is happening. I don't know in uh, which other places, but in Gaia X is happening because we have this peculiar structure. We have a central association. Then we have a constellation of national hubs. Each hub is connected to the local government. Then we connect the governments. So we have created this model where they are totally independent, but they started talking to each other. They started sharing ideas. And as a consequence, they share those investments. <clears throat> So uh, I have a question with respect to countries that has already a very good digital infrastructure. I'm thinking about Estonia because I live there. And then there, there is like this- I'm uh, sorry? Estonia. Estonia. Because I live there. Uh, so basically uh, there, there was this uh, data exchange platform, uh, which is called X-Road. X-Road, so you know whatever. Uh, so do you plan to you know assimilate this kind of uh, infrastructures or like to- Substitute them or like. Uh... Grazie della domanda. Um, absolutely, yes. It's not yet public, but uh, I am signing uh, agreements with uh, X Road, with uh, iShare, 
and with uh, another one um, which is called Trust Relay, which is which was made in Switzerland for smart cities. So there is some other initiatives that started. Estonia was the first one and very successful, mainly uh, aimed to the public sector. Uh, iShare was started in the Netherlands, mainly aimed to the logistics sector, of course, Netherlands, uh, et cetera. Uh, GaiaX is kind of grouping all the expectations. So we decided to, first of all, they were all you know, looking at us and the evolution. They some way somehow stopped at a certain level so they cannot scale more. But together, we can leverage what they've done. We can leverage their existing onboarded members. We can leverage their existing verification nodes, which is very important. And I aim to leverage them to quick start, let me say, the ramp up of the GAIAX compliance service. This is, like I said, this is not public yet, but this is my strategy. But absolutely, yes, we are on the same page and we all want to collaborate. Nobody wants to go by himself. Nomino Di Martino, um, which are uh, your relationships with the, the national cloud strategies for public administration above all? Namely, the Italian national cloud strategy, since we are in Italy and you are Italian. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the trend is to concentrate services and data from the public uh, uh, administration uh, in central repositories uh, managed by the public authorities and so on. How does this, uh, uh, as a uh, to do with the concept of federation, the concept of edge, which especially for sensitive data that are the citizen data is something of paramount importance, sanitary data and so on. Yes, uh, in Italy, we cannot speak about the future because it's gonna be next Monday, so we will see. But I can tell you that I've been working very closely with the uh, Minister Colau and uh, if you, go back and read let me let me say the genesis of the polo strategico nazionale there are strong references to gaia x now you may say yes but well is this really x compliant it's i've been working with the with the cabinet of the minister there is total alignment and the polo strategico nazionale is nothing more nothing less than what other states are doing uh, some someone is going faster some someone is going slower but everybody wants to have a kind of uh, sovereign uh, cloud infrastructure to manage uh, critical data. Now, the important thing of the Polo Strategico Nazionale behind the intentions is that it introduces two principles. One is the data classification. So there is three levels of classification of data. The critical one, the strategic one, the non-critical ones. And of course, for non-critical ones, I mean, you don't need necessarily strong measures of localization, for example, or the strategic ones you have to. The second concept is the date is the service qualification. So in order to treat a critical data, you have to have services that must be qualified uh, as suitable to treat those data. And this is where the rule set that they are defining is important. Now, how are you going to verify those rules? How are you going to onboard, for example, services from uh, cloud service providers that might want to provide uh, services to the public administration? Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, MEPAS DAPA portals in, in Italy. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But the procedure that was made by Agid to onboard services was quite manual. Now, what I hope is that in the future, having Gaia X qualified services and maybe labeled with the specific label that the Italian state will do, I hope, there would be an easy way to do it. But I can tell you that other states are exactly moving in that direction. So of course they've been waiting for us. I mean, we were not mature last year, and now they will see that this, this thing is possible. So by the end of this year, I'm expecting these labels to be defined. I'm expecting the first adaptation, the, the, the first adoptions of this type of rules. So, so to answer your question, Italian government is in line uh, Prime Minister Draghi was one of the strong supporters of Gaia X. Of course, he comes from the European Commission. Minister Cola was a strong supporter. The Italian hub was uh, going pretty slow, I have to say, unfortunately. 
but because there was a kind of a deadlock between uh, the local hub expecting the local government to tell them what to do and the local government expecting for the local hub to give them proposals. <laughs> it's quite a typical deadlock. Uh, let's not talk about the deadlock now because we're going to see the new government. Uh, but I can tell you that Spain, Germany, France, all the other countries are totally aligned and they're just waiting for the new elections to see who to work with. Thank you for being here and uh, for giving us this important talk. Uh, but I would like to understand better uh, your point on something that I didn't understand quite correct. So you're talking about a market, data market, and in the market that are producers, owners of data, and sell sellers and buyers. And I don't see anything about that in a, in a Gaia X uh, um, proposal. So who is the owner of the data? Who is repaying? How do you repay the owners of the data? In order to build trust, you also need to build uh, uh, the fact that someone who is owning this data uh, is uh, giving that data for, for something. And to go back, citizens are owning that data. How do you deal with that? Well, uh, I, I was not so successful if you didn't see anything about trust. Gay access all about trust. So you have to, and I, I fully understand the question because data, personal data are gonna drive the economy, yes. But nowadays we have personal and non-personal data and data from the enterprise is the main one that can drive the economy. In other words, if you don't share the data across the automotive space, or let's talk about healthcare. If you don't share data across hospitals to drive, I don't know, uh, preventing medicine through genomic sequenciation, we will not progress. That's not just personal data. Who's that data? Uh, let me get to the point. The personal data is a tricky question because we have the GDPR protecting it. You must know that we have the consent management. And you must know that, I don't know how many of you uh, have tried to check if the applications and the platforms you use provide you acceptance of the concept management. All of them do, but unfortunately, you don't realize that. You check a box and the concept management is given. Try to get the data back. This is an example. Yes, you're giving out your personal data. Everybody implements, legally speaking, the concept management. But when you try to get your data back or transfer your data, you're gonna be in a quite difficult position to do that. What we're trying to do is we are forcing the services, which are business services, to be described also in terms of concept management, also in terms of transferability, also in terms of reversibility in your identity card of the service. In this way, you will be able to see, read the characteristics of a service and decide whether you want to use it or not. Nowadays, maybe you don't see it, maybe you see it, but you skip it. It's not transparent. So that's one question. KX is all about trust, but to have trust, I need to recognize you. If I don't know your identity, I cannot verify it. If I don't know your characteristics, I cannot verify them. I cannot trust you. Whether I'm a citizen using a, 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 a B2C service or I am a company using a B2B service. When it gets to personal data, uh, I think that what you say is very true and I totally agree with you. The future economy is gonna be totally driven by personal data. But nowadays, the legislation and the regulation does not fully support that concept. Why I say that? The GDPR tells you how to protect your rights on your personal data. It does not talk about non-personal data. It does not talk about indirect data produced through your personal data. After four years, five years, four years, we have the Data Act. And I'm very glad that this act came out because for four years, we were stuck because we knew what we could not do with data. We didn't know what to do with data. The Data Act introduces, and I was talking about that at the coffee, introduces two very strong concepts. One is the extension, let me say, of your rights, not just to your personal data, but also to your non-personal data produced through your personal data. So I give my data to an app. I'm not going to say any name here. And they build a service on top of those data. Then I have the right to use the data they have developed, starting from my data, and transfer those data to someone else. 
It's a kind of, G, uh, of PSD2 for those that know the banking sector. Like I have was to open your bank to make all your banking data available. It's a huge change. So you as a citizen, you will be able to decide not only how your data are used, but also uh, the data produced by others that started from your data. The second principle is the redistribution of the value, which means who is using my data, I am the data owner, if they make a value out of it, they will have to show the value and I have to have some value back. It's a long way, it's, but we are at the beginning of it. But to achieve what you say, we must have some regulation. So I'm very happy we have the Data Act, which is pretty recent. I don't know if any one of you knows that, but it's an interesting move into the direction that you say. The constant management is the most important thing. Uh, within our members, uh, I have many companies. Most of them are startups that have focused totally on that. And actually what I want to do, I want to start very soon a B2C, if you want, or a citizen working group specifically to that. I can tell you that there is some very good uh, solutions started in Europe. And uh, I think that they will need to leverage what the Data Act is introducing. But in the end of the day, the business, uh, the services come from businesses. So we are trying to fix trust rules for the business and they will propagate down to users by definition. Thank you, but that, that was a very good question. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I don't want to be the bad guy here, but we have to close the session. Otherwise we do not have time for the panel. So save the question for the panel since the discussion is similar even in the panel. So uh, thank you very much again for your inspiring presentation. I guess that we can start the panel. So uh, please, uh, panelists, join us. And Claudio will uh, will uh, do the panel chair remotely. <laughs>